It's a little bit blustery today, so I hope that doesn't make it this recording too terrible to listen to, but this is 1918 of the Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, 1917 to 1921, by Maurice Sprinton, a pamphlet released by Solidarity in 1970. January 6th. Dissolution of Constituent Assembly. The detachment which dispersed the assembly was led by anarchist Kronstad sailor Zhelezhnikov, now commander of the Taurid Palace Guard. He unseated the chairman of the assembly, Viktor Chernov, with the blunt announcement, quote, the guard is tired, end quote. January 17th to 14th. First All-Russian Congress of Trade Unions held in Petrograd. Two main themes were to dominate the Congress. What were to be the relations between the factories, committees, and the unions? And what were to be the relations between the trade unions and the new Russian state? Few delegates at this stage sensed the close relationship between these two questions. Still fewer perceived how a simultaneous resolution of the first question in favor of the unions and of the second in favor of the new, quote, workers' state, end quote, would soon emasculate the committees and in fact irrevocably undermine the proletarian nature of the regime. The arguments at this Congress reflected matters of deep significance and will be referred to in some detail. In the balance lay the future of the Russian working class and for for many decades to come. According to Lazovsky, a Bolshevik trade unionist, quote, the factory committees were so much the owners and masters that three months after the revolution they were to to a significant degree independent of the general controlling organs, end quote. Maisky, then still a Menshevik, said that in his experience, quote, It was not just some of the proletariat, but most of the proletariat, especially in Petrograd, who looked upon workers' control as if it were actually the emergence of the kingdom of socialism, end quote. He lamented that among the workers, quote, the very idea of socialism is embodied in the concept of workers' control, end quote. Another Menshevik delegate deplored the fact that, quote, an anarchist wave in the shape of factory committees and workers' control was sweeping over our Russian labor movement, end quote. D.B. Ryazanov, a recent convert to Bolshevism, agreed with the Mensheviks on this point and argued the fa- urged the factory committees, quote, to commit suicide by becoming an integral element of the trade union structure, end quote. And got some footnotes here. Um... Footnote, yeah, footnote. D.B. Ryazanov, a Marxist scholar best known as the historiographer of the International Workingmen's Association, the first international, later became the founder of the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow and published a biography of Marx and Lenin, end quote. The few anarcho-syndicalist delegates to the, oh, and a footnote. The few anarcho-syndicalist delegates to the Congress, quote, fought a desperate battle to preserve the autonomy of the committees, Maximov, end quote, oh, excuse me, Maximov claimed that he and his fellow anarchist syndicalists were, quote, better Marxists, end quote, than either the Mensheviks or the Bolsheviks, a declaration which caused a great stir in the hall, end quote. Footnote. Grigory Petrovich Maximov, born in 1893, graduated as an agronomist in Petrograd in 1915, joined the revolutionary movement while still a student. In 1918, he joined the Red Army. When the Bolsheviks used the army for police work and for disarming the workers, he refused to obey orders and was sentenced to death. The solidarity of the steelworkers' union saved his life. Edited anarcho-syndicalist papers, Golos Truda, Voice of Labor, and Novi Golos Truda, New Voice of Labor, arrested March 8, 1921, during the Kronstadt Uprising. Released later, 
that year following a hunger strike, but only after the intervention of European delegates attending the Congress of Red Trade Union International, sought exile abroad. In Berlin, edited the Bocci Put Labor's Path, Paper of Russian Syndicalists in Exile, later went into went to Paris and finally settled in Chicago, died in 1950, author of various works on anarchism and the Bolshevik terror, The Guillotine at Work, 19, published in 1940. End of footnote. Maximov was alluding, no doubt, to Marx's statement that the liberation of the working class had to be brought about by the workers themselves. Maximov urged the delegates to remember, quote, that the factory committee's organizations introduced directly by life itself in the course of the revolution were the closest of all the working, all to the working class, much closer than the trade unions, end quote. Footnote. It is interesting that a great Marxist in quotes, as Rux Rosa Luxemburg was to proclaim at the founding Congress of the German Communist Party that the trade unions were destined to disappear, being replaced by councils of workers and soldiers' deputies, and by factory committees. End of footnote. The function of the committees was no longer to protect and improve the conditions of the workers, they had to seek a predominant position in industry and in the economy. Quote, as the offspring of the revolution of the, the committees, as offspring of the revolution, the committees would create a new production on a new basis. End quote. The unions, quote, which corresponded to the old economic relations of czarist times, had lived out their time and couldn't take on this task. End quote. Maximov anticipated a great, con a quote, great conflict between state power in the center and the organizations composed exclusively of workers which are found in the localities, end quote. Quote, the aim of the proletariat was to coordinate all activity, all local interests to create a center, but not a center of decrees and ordinances, but a center of regulation, of guidance, and only through such a center organize the industrial life of the country. Yeah, I gotta go inside. This is this wind is a little too much. Speaking on behalf of the factory committees, a rank-and-file worker, Belusov, made a seething attack on the party leaders. The continually they continually criticized the committees, quote, for not acting according to the rules and regulations, end quote, but then failed to produce any coherent plan of their own. They just talked. Quote, all this will freeze local work. We are to stand locally, still locally wait and do nothing? Only then will we make no mistakes. Only those who do nothing make no mistakes." End quote. The real workers' control was the solution to Russia's economic disintegration. Quote, the only way out remaining to the workers is to take the factories into their own hands and manage them. End quote. Excitement in the Congress reached a climax when Bill Shatov, characterized the trade unions as, quote, living corpses, end quote, and urged the working class, quote, to organize in the localities and create a free new Russia without a god, without a czar, and without a boss in the trade union, end quote. Footnote. Vladimir Shatov, born in Russia, emigrated to Canada and the USA. In 1914, secretly reprinted 100,000 copies of Margaret Sanger's notorious birth control pamphlet, Family Limitation, worked as machinist, longshoreman, and printer, joined IWW, later helped produce Golos Truda, weekly anarcho-syndicalist organ of the Union of Russian Workers of the United States and Canada, returned to Petrograd in July 1917, and, quote, 
replanted Golos Truda in the Russian capital, end quote. Later became member of Petrograd Military Revolutionary Committee and an officer of the 10th Red Army. In 1919, he played an important role in the defense of Petrograd against Udenich. In 1920, he became Minister of Transport in the Far Eastern Soviet Republic, disappeared during the 1936-38 purges. End of footnote. When Ryazanov protested Shatov's vilification of the unions, Maximov rose to his comrades' defense, dismissing Ryazanov's objections as those of white-handed, those of a white-handed intellectual who had never worked, never sweated, never felt life. Another anarcho-syndicalist delegate, Laptev, by name, reminded the gathering that the revolution had been made, quote, not only by the intellectuals but by the masses, end quote. Therefore, it was imperative for Russia to, quote, listen to the voice of the working masses, the voice from below, end quote. The anarcho-syndicalist resolution calling for, quote, real workers' control, not state workers' control, end quote, and urging that the, quote, organization of production, transport, and distribution be immediately transferred to the hands of the toiling people themselves and not to the state or some civil service machine, made up of one kind or other of class enemy, end quote, was defeated. The main strength of the anarcho-syndicalists was among the miners of the Debaltsev district in the Donbassin, among the port workers and cement workers of Ex Ekater excuse me, Ekaterinodar and Novorossiysk and among Moscow railway workers. At the Congress, they held 25 delegates on the basis of one delegate per 3,000 3, to 3,500 members. The new government would have none of all this talk about extending the power of the committees. It clearly recognized in the unions a, quote, more stable, end quote, end quote, less anarchic, end quote, force. <laughs> i.e. a force more amenable to control from above in which it could provisionally vest in, in administrative functions in industry. The Bolsheviks therefore urged, quote, the trade union organizations as class organizations of the proletariat constructed according to the industrial principle to take upon themselves the main task of organizing production and of restoring the weakened productive forces of the country, end quote. Quoted in, in German by Shlyapnikov. At a later stage, the Bolsheviks were to fight tooth and nail to divest the unions of the very these very functions and place them firmly in the hands of party nominees. In fact, the party demands of January 1918 were again and again to be thrown back in the face of the Bolshevik leaders during the next three years. This will be dealt with further on. The Congress, with its overwhelming Bolshevik majority, voted to transform the factory committees into union organs. The Mensheviks and social revolutionary delegates voted with the Bolsheviks for a resolution proclaiming that, quote, the centralization of workers' control was the task of the trade unions, end quote. Quote, Workers' control, end quote, was defined as, quote, the instrument by which the universal economic plan must be put into effect locally, end quote. Quote, it implied the definite idea of standardization in the sphere of production, end quote. It was too bad if the workers read more into the term than this. Quote, just because the workers misunderstand and falsely interpret workers' control is no reason to repudiate it, end quote. What the party meant by workers' control was spelt out in some detail. It meant inter alia that, quote, it was not within the competence of the lower organs of workers' control to be entrusted with financial fu control function. This should rest with the highest organ of control, with the general apparatus of management, with the Supreme Council of National Economy. In the sphere of finance, everything must be left to the higher organs of workers' control. 
for workers' control to be of maximum use to the proletariat, it was absolutely necessary to refrain from atomizing it. Workers of individual enterprises should not be left the right to make final decisions on questions touching upon the existence of the enterprise, end quote. A lot of re-education was needed, and this was to be entrusted to the, quote, economic control commissions, end quote, of the unions. They were to inculcate into the ranks of the workers the Bolshevik conception of workers' control, quote, the trade unions must go over each decree of the factory committees in the sphere of control, explain through their delegates at the factories and shops that control over production does not mean the transfer of the enterprise into the hands of the workers of a given enterprise, that it does not equal the socialization of production and exchange, end quote. Once the committees had been, quote, devoured, end quote, the unions were to be the intermediate agency through which workers' control was gradually to be converted into state control. <laughs> These were not abstract discussions. Underlying the controversies that was, that was at stake was the whole concept of socialism, workers' power or the power of the party acting on behalf of the working class. Quote, if workers succeeded in maintaining their ownership of the factories they had seized, if they ran these factories for themselves, if they considered the revolution to be at an end, if they considered socialism to have been established, then there would have been no need for the revolutionary leadership of the Bolsheviks." End quote. The bitterness with which the issue of the factory committees was discussed highlights another point. Quote, Although the, fa the Bolsheviks were in a majority at the first all-Russian conference of factory committees, and although, as representatives of the factory committees, they could force resolutions through this conference only, they could not enforce resolutions against the opposition of the B factory committees themselves. The factory committees accepted Bolshevik leadership only so long as divergences and goals were not brought to the test." End quote. Kaplan. <laughs> the first trade union congress was witnessed, also witnessed a heated controversy on the question of the relation of the trade unions to the state. The Mensheviks claiming that the resolution, the revolution, could only usher in a bourgeois democratic republic, insisted on the autonomy of the unions in relation to the new Russian state, as Maisky put it. Quote, if capitalism remains intact. The tasks with which trade unions are confronted under capitalism remain unaltered, end quote. Others, too, felt that capitalism would reassert itself and that the unions should do nothing that would impair their power. Martov put a more sophisticated viewpoint, quote, in this historic situation, end quote. He said, quote, this government cannot represent the working class alone. It cannot but be a de facto administration connected with a heterogeneous mass of toiling people, with proletarian and non-proletarian elements alike. It cannot, therefore, conduct its economic policy along the lines of consistently and clearly expressed working class interests, end quote. The trade unions could. Therefore, the trade unions should retain a certain independence in relation to the new state. It is interesting that in his 1921 controversy with Trotsky, that when incidentally it was far too late, Lenin was too much. Uh, it is interesting that in his 1921 controversy with Trotsky, when incidentally it was far too late, Lenin was to use much the same kind of argument. He was to stress the need for the workers to defend themselves against quote their own end quote state defined as not just a, quote, worker's state, but a worker's and peasant's state, end quote. And moreover, one with, quote, bureaucratic deformations, end quote. The Bolshevik viewpoint, supported by Lenin and Trotsky and voiced by Zinoviev, was that the trade union should be subordinated in the government, subordinated to the government, although not assimilated with the government. Trade union neutrality was officially labeled a, quote, bourgeois idea, a anomaly in a worker's state. The resolution, 
adopted by the Congress clearly express these dominant ideas. The trade unions ought to shoulder the main, excuse me, quote, the trade unions ought to shoulder the main burden of organizing production and of rehabilitating the country's shattered economic forces. The most urgent task consists in their energetic participation in all central bodies called upon to regulate output, in the organization of workers' control, in the registration and distribution of the labor force, in the organization of exchange between town and countryside, in the struggle against sabotage and in enforcing the general obligation to work. As they develop, the trade union should, in the process of the present socialist revolution, become organs of socialist power, and as such, they should work in coordination with and subordination to other bodies in order to carry into effect the new principles. The Congress is convinced... <coughs> That it is that in consequence of the foreshadowed process, the trade unions will inevitably become transformed into organs of the socialist state. Participation in the trade unions will, for all people employed in any industry, be their duty vis a vis the state. End quote. The Bolsheviks did not unanimously accept Lenin's views on these questions. While Tomsky, their main spokesman on trade union affairs, pointed out that, quote, sectional interest of groups of workers had to be subordinated to the interest of the entire class, end quote, which, like so many Bolsheviks, he wrongly identified with the hegemony of the Bolshevik party. Ryazanov argued that, quote, as long as the social revolution begun here has not merged with the social revolution of Europe and the whole world, the Russian proletariat must on, be on its guard and must not renounce a single one of its weapons. It must maintain its trade union organization, end quote. According to Zinoviev, the, quote, independence, end quote, of the trade unions under a workers' government could mean nothing except the right to support, quote, saboteurs, end quote. Despite this, Saipurovich, a prominent trade, a prominent Bolshevik trade unionist, proposed that the Congress ratify the right of trade unions to continue to resort to strike action in defense of their members. A resolution to this effect was, however, defeated. As might be expected, the dominant attitude of the dominant party, both in relation to the factory committees and in relation to the unions, was to play an important role in the subsequent development of events. It was to prove as much a, quote, objective fact of history, end quote, as the, quote, devastation, end quote, and the, quote, atomization of the working class, end quote, caused by the subsequent civil war. It could, in fact, be argued that Bolshevik attitudes to factory committees and the dashing of the great hopes that these committees represented for hundreds of thousands of workers were to engender or reinforce working-class apathy and cynicism, contribute to absenteeism, and to the seeking of private solutions to what were social problems, all of which the Bolsheviks were so loudly to decry. It is above all essential to stress that the Bolshevik policy in relation to the committees and to the unions, which we have documented in some detail, was being put forward 12 months before the murder of Karl Liebknecht and of Rosa Luxemburg, i.e. before the irrevocable failure of the German Revolution and the and event usually taken as, quote, justifying, end quote, many of the measures taken by the Russian rulers. January 15th to 21st, 1918. First All-Russian Congress of Textile Workers held in Moscow, Bolsheviks in a majority. The Congress declared the, quote, work that, quote, workers' control is only a transitional step to the planned organization of production and distribution, end quote. The Union adopted new statutes proclaiming that, quote, the lowest cells of the Union in the factory committee, whose obligation consists of putting into effect in a given enterprise all the decrees of the Union, end quote. 
Even the big stick was waved. Addressing the Congress, Lozovsky stated that, quote, if the local patriotism of individual factories conflicts with the interests of the whole proletariat, we unconditionally state that we will not hesitate before any measures for the suppression of tendencies harmful to the toilers, end quote. The party, in other words, can impose its concept of the interests of the working class even against the workers themselves. January 23rd to 31st, Third All-Russian Congress of Soviets. February, Bolshevik decree nationalizing the land. March 3rd, 1918, signature of the Brest-Litovsk Preach Peace Treaty. Decree issued by Vysenka, defining the functions of technical management and industry. Each administrative center was to appoint to every enterprise under its care a commissioner, who would be the government representative and supervisor, and two directors, one technical and the other administrative. The technical director could only be overruled by the government commissioner or by the, quote, central direction, end quote, of the industry. In other words, only the, quote, administrative director, end quote, was under some kind of control from below. The decree laid down the principle that, quote, in nationalized enterprises, workers' control is exercised by submitting all declarations and decisions of the factory or shop committees or of the control commission to the economic administrative council for approval, end quote. Quote, not more than half the members of the administrative council should be workers or employees, end quote. During the early months of 1918, the Visenka had begun to build from the top its, quote, unified administration, end quote, of particular industries. The pattern was informative. During 1917 and 1916, the Tsarist government had set up central bodies, sometimes called, quote, committees, and sometimes, quote, centers, end quote, governing the activities of industries, producing commodities directly or indirectly necessary for the war. By 1917, these central bodies, generally composed of representatives of the industry concerned in exercising regulatory functions of a rather undefined character, had spread over the most almost the whole field of industrial production. During the first half of 1918, Vysenka gradually took over these bodies, or what was left of them, and converted them under the name of Glavki, chief committees or centri, centers, into administrative organs subject to the direct direction and control of Vysenka. The, quote, chief committee, end quote, for the leather industry, Glavkovs, was set up in January 1918. This was quickly followed by chief paper and sugar committees and by soap and tea, quote, centers, end quote. These together with Centrotextil <laughs> were all in existence by March 1918. They, quote, could scarcely have come into being except on foundations already laid before the revolution or without the collaboration of the managerial and technical staffs. A certain tacit community of interest could be detected between the government and the more sensible and moderate of the industrialists in bringing about a return to some kind of orderly production, end quote. This raised a question of considerable theoretical interest. Marxists have usually argued that revolutionaries could not simply seize the political institutions of bourgeois society, parliament, etc., and use them for different purposes, i.e. for the introduction of socialism. They have always claimed that new political institutions, Soviets, would have to be created to express the reality of workers' power, but they have usually remained discreetly silent on the question of whether revolutionaries could, quote, capture, end quote, the institutions of bourgeois economic power and use them to their own ends, or whether these two would have first to be smashed, the latter replaced with a new kind of institution representing a fundamental change in the relations of production. The Bolsheviks in 1918 clearly opted for the first course, even within their own ranks,
This choice was to give rise to foreboding that all energies would now be directed to the, quote, reinforcement and development of productive capacity to organic construction, italicies, involving a refusal to continue the breakup of capitalist production relations and even a partial restoration of them, end quote. That, is, that quote is from E.H. Carr. Oh. A very sympathetic historian of the Bolshevik Revolution. To my understanding, maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, I've never read in his scholarly works. Important figure, though, I think, uh, also like in historical methodology and stuff, but a uh, big historian of the Russian Revolution. March 6th to 8th, 1918. Seventh Party Congress. He did deliberations during the very short Congress centered on the signing of the Brest Litovsk Treaty, Peace Treaty. March 14th to 18th, 1918. Fourth All Russian Congress of Soviets. March 1918. Quote, left, end quote, communists Osinsky, Bukharin, Lamov, Smirnov ousted from leading, leading positions in Supreme Economic Council, partly because of their attitude to brest the task, and replaced by, quote, moderates, end quote, like Milyutin and Rykov. Immediate steps taken to shore up managerial authority, restore labor discipline, and apply wage incentives under the supervision of trade the trade union organizations. The whole episode was a clear demonstration that, quote, lefts, end quote, in top administrative positions are no substitute for rank-and-file control at the point of production. March 26, 1918. Izvestia of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee publishes decree issued by the Council of People's Commissars on the, quote, centralization of railway management, end quote. This decree, which ended workers' control on the railways, quote, was, quote, an absolutely necessary prerequisite for the improvement of the conditions of the transport system, end quote. It stressed the urgency of, quote, iron labor discipline, end quote, and, quote, individual management, end quote, on the railways and granted, quote, dictatorial, end quote, powers to the commissariat of ways of communication, Clause 6 proclaimed the need for selected individuals to act as, quote, administrative technical executives, end quote, in every local district or regional railway center. These individuals were to be, quote, responsible to the people's commissars of ways of communication, end quote. They were to be the, quote, embodiment of the whole of the dictatorial power of the proletariat in the given railway center, end quote. March 30th, 1918. Oh, excuse me, that quote was from, was from Lenin. Okay, March 30th, 1918. Trotsky appointed Commissar of Military Affairs after Brest the Tosk. Had rapidly been reorganizing the Red Army. The death penalty for disobedience under fire had been restored. So more gradually had saluting special forms of address, separate living quarters, and other privileges for officers. Footnote. For years, Trotskyist literature had denounced these reactionary facets of the Red Army as examples of what happened to it, quote, under Stalinism, end quote. They were in fact first challenged by Smirnov at the Eighth Party Congress in March 1919. Democratic forms of organization, including the election of officers, had been quickly dispensed with. Quote, the elective basis, end quote, Trotsky wrote, quote, is politically pointless and technically inexpedient and has already been set aside by decree, end quote. N.V. Krylenko, one of the co-commissars of military affairs appointed after the October Revolution had resigned in disgust from the defense establishment as a result of these measures. October, I mean, 
April 3rd, 1918, the Central Council of the Trade Unions issued its first detailed pronouncement on the function of the trade unions in relation to, quote, labor discipline, end quote, end quote, incentives, end quote. The trade unions should, quote, apply all their efforts to raise the productivity of labor and consistently to create in factories and workshops the indispensable foundations of labor discipline, end quote. Every union should establish a commission, quote, to fix norms of productivity for every trade and category of workers, end quote. The use of peace rates, quote, to raise the productivity of labor, end quote, was conceded. It was claimed that, quote, bonuses for increased productivity above the established norm may within certain limits be a useful measure for raising productivity without exhausting the worker, end quote. Finally, if, quote, individual groups of workers refused to submit to union discipline, they could in the last resort be expelled from the union, quote, with all the consequences that flow therefrom, end quote. April 11th to 12th, 1918, armed detachments of Cheka raid 26 anarchist centers in Moscow. Fighting breaks out between Cheka agents and black guardsmen in Donskoy Monastery. 40 anarchists killed or wounded, over 500 taken prisoner. April 20th, 1918. The issue of workers' control was now being widely discussed within the party. Petrograd District Committee publishes first issue of Communist, a quote, or, I don't know why it said Communist, it just says it's, com it's Communist with a K, I don't know how it's pronounced in Russian. A quote left, end quote, communist theoretical journal, journal etiquette, edited by Bukharin, Radek, and Ozinski, later to be joined by Smirnov. This issue contained the editor's, quote, theses on the present situation, end quote. The paper denounced, quote, a labor policy designed to implant discipline among the workers under the flag of, quote, self-discipline, end quote. The introduction of labor service for workers, peace rates, and the lengthening of the working day, end quote. It proclaimed that, quote, the introduction of labor discipline in connection with the restoration of capitalist management of industry cannot really increase the productivity of labor, end quote. It would, quote, diminish the class initiative activity and organization of the proletariat. It threatens to enslave the working class. It will arouse discontent among the backward elements as well as among the vanguard of the proletariat. In order to introduce this, this system in the face of the hated, in face of the hatred prevailing at present among the proletariat against, proletariat against the, quote, capitalist sab saboteurs, end quote, the Communist Party would have to rely on the petty bourgeoisie as against the workers, end quote. It would, quote, ruin itself as the party of the proletariat. End quote. The issue of the new paper was contained, also contained a serious warning by Radek. Quote, if the Russian Revolution were overthrown by violence on the part of the bourgeois counter-revolution, it would rise again like a phoenix. If, however, it lost its socialist character and thereby disappointed the working masses, the blow would have ten times more terrible consequences for the future of the Russian and the International Revolution, end quote. The same issue warned of, quote, bureaucratic centralization, the rule of various commissars, the loss of independence for local Soviets, and in practice, the rejection of the type of state commune administered from below, end quote. Quote, it was all very well, end quote, Bukharin pointed out, Quote, to say, as Lenin had in State and Revolution, that each cook should learn to manage the state. But what happened when each cook had a commissar appointed to him, appointed to order him about? End quote. The second issue of the paper contains some prophetic comments by Ozinski. Quote, we stand for the construction of the proletarian society by the class creativity of the workers themselves, not by the ukases of the captains of industry, if the proletariat itself does not know how to create the necessary prerequisites for socialist organization of labor, no one can do this for it, and no one can compel it to do this.
the stick, if raised against the workers, will find itself in the hands of a social force which is either under the influence of another social class or is in the hands of the Soviet power, but the Soviet power will then be forced to seek support against the proletariat from another class, e.g. the peasantry, and by this it will destroy itself as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Socialism and socialist organization will be set up by the proletariat itself, or they will not be set up at all. Something else will be set up. State capitalism. End quote. Osinski. Lenin reacted very sharply. The usual vituperation followed. The views of the, quote, left and, quote, communists were a, quote, disgrace, quote, a complete renunciation of communism in practice, end quote, quote, a desertion to the camp of the petty bourgeoisie, end quote. That's from left-wing childishness and petty bourgeois mentality by Lenin. The left were being, quote, provoked by the Isovs, Mensheviks, and other Judases of capitalism, end quote. A campaign was whipped up in Petrograd which compelled Communist, the journal, to transfer publication to Moscow, where the paper reappeared first under the auspices of the Moscow Regional Organization of the Party, later as the, quote, unofficial, end quote, mouthpiece of a group of comrades. After the appearance of the first issue of the paper, a hastily convened Petrograd Party conference produced a majority for Lenin and, quote, demanded that the adherents of communists cease their separate organizational existence, end quote. So much for alleged factional rights in 1918, i.e., long before the 10th Congress officially prohibited factions in 1921. During the following months, the Leninists succeeded in extending their organizational control into areas which had originally backed the, quote, lefts, end quote. By the end of May, the predominantly proletarian party organization in the Ural region, led by Priobrzezinski and the Moscow Regional Bureau of the party, had been won back by the supporters of the party leadership. The fourth and final issue of Communist, issued in May 1918, had to be published as a private factional paper. The settlement of these important issues profoundly affecting the whole working class had not been, quote, by discussion, persuasion, or compromise, but by a high-pressure campaign in the party organizations, backed by a barrage of violent invectives in the party press and in the pronouncements of the party leaders. Lenin's polemics set the tone and his organizational lieutenants brought the membership into line, end quote. That's a footnote from R.V. Daniels. Uh, the footnote says that that quote's from R.V. Daniels. I'm assuming that's from The Conscience of the Revolution, the book that Daniels wrote. Uh, many in the traditional revolutionary movement will be thoroughly familiar with these methods. April 28th. Lenin's article on the immediate tasks of the Soviet government published in Izvestia of the Oil Russian Central Executive Committee, quote, measures and decrees, end quote, were called for, quote, to raise labor discipline, end quote, which was, quote, the condition of economic revival, end quote. Among the measures suggested were the introduction of card system, a card system for registering the productivity of each worker, the introduction of factory regulations in every enterprise, the establishment of rate of output bureau for the purpose of fixing the output of each worker, and payment of bonuses for increased productivity. If Lenin ever sensed the potentially harmful aspects of these proposals, he certainly never mentioned it. No great imagination was needed, however, to see in the pen pushers recording the, quote, productivity of each worker, end quote, and in the clerks manning the, quote, rate of output bureau, end quote, as the, the as yet amorphous elements of a new bureaucracy. 
Lenin went even further. Lenin wrote, quote, We must raise the question of peace work and apply and test the qu it in practice. We must raise the question of applying much of what is scientific and progressive in the Taylor system. The Soviet Republic must at all costs adopt all that is valuable in the achievements of science and technology in this field. We must organize in Russia the study and teaching of the Taylor system. End quote. Only the quote, conscious representatives of the petty bourgeois of petty bourgeois laxity, end quote, could see in the recent decree on the management of the railways, quote, which granted individual leaders dictatorial powers, end quote, some kind of, quote, departure from the collegium principle, from demo democracy, and from other principles of Soviet government, end quote. Quote, the irrefutable experience of history has shown that the dictatorship of individual persons was very often the vehicle, the channel of the dictatorship of the revolutionary classes. Large-scale machine industry, which is the material productive source and foundation of socialism, calls for absolute and strict unity of will. How can strict unity of will be ensured? By thousands subordinating their will to the will of one. Unquestioning submission to a single will is absolutely necessary for the success of labor processes that are based on large-scale machine industry. Today, the revolution demands, in the interest of socialism, that the masses unquestioningly obey the single will, emphasis in original, of the leaders of the labor process. End quote. Lenin. Oh, there's another footnote note here that says, Before the revolution, Lenin had denounced Taylorism as, quote, the enslavement of man by the machine, end quote. End of footnote. The demand for, quote, unquestioning obedience has... The demand for, quote, unquestioning, end quote, obedience has, throughout history, been voiced by countless reactionaries who have sought, moreover, to impose such obedience on those over whom they exerted authority. A highly critical and self-critical attitude is, on the other hand, the hallmark of the real revolutionary. May 1918. Berev, Esnik, Anarchia, Golos, Tuda, and other leading anarchist periodicals are closed down. Priyabrzhensky, writing in Communist, warns, quote, the party will soon have to decide to what degree the dictatorship of individuals will be extended from the railroads and other branches of the economy to the party itself, end quote. May 5th, 1918. Publication of left-wing childishness and petty bourgeois mentality. After denouncing communists, the journals, views, as a, quote, riot of phrase-mongering, end quote, quote, the flaunting of high-sounding phrases, end quote, etc., etc., Lenin attempted to answer some of the points made by the, quote, left communists. According to Lenin, quote, state capitalism wasn't a danger. It was, on the contrary, something to be aimed for, quote, if we introduce state capitalism in approximately six months' time, or excuse me, quote, if we introduce state capitalism in approximately six months' time, we would achieve a great success and a sure guarantee that within a year, socialism will have gained a permanently firm hold and will have become invincible in our country. Economically, state capitalism is immeasurably superior to the present system of economy. The Soviet power has nothing terrible to fear from state capitalism. For the Soviet state is a state in which the power of the workers and the poor is assured. Because of a, quote, workers, uh, is assured, end quote. Because a, quote, workers' party, end quote, held political power. The, quote, sum total of the necessary conditions for socialism, end quote, were, quote, 
large-scale capitalist technique based on the last word of modern science, inconceivable without planned state organization, which subjects tens of millions of people to the strictest observance of a single standard in production and distribution, end quote. End quote, proletarian state power, end quote. It is important to note that the power of the working class in production isn't mentioned as one of the, quote, necessary conditions for socialism, end quote. Lenin continues by pointing out that in 1918, the, quote, two unconnected halves of socialism existed side by side like two future chickens in a single shell of international imperialism, end quote. In 1918, Germany and Russia were the embodiments, respectively, of the, quote, economic and productive, economic productive and social economic conditions for socialism on the one hand, and of the political conditions on the other, end quote. The task of the Bolsheviks was to, quote, to study the state capitalism of the Germans to spare no effort in copying it, end quote. They shouldn't, quote, shrink from adopting dictatorial methods to hasten the copying of it, end quote. As originally published, Lenin's text then contained the interesting phrase, quote, Our task is to hasten this even more than Peter hastened the adoption of Westernism by barbarian Russia, not shrinking from the use of barbarous methods to fight barbarism, end quote. This was perhaps the only admiring reference to any czar in any of Lenin's writings, in quoting this passage three years later, Lenin omitted the reference to Peter the Great. Quote, one, of the, on the, uh, excuse me, quote, one and the same road, end quote, Lenin continued, quote, led from the petty bourgeois capitalism that prevailed in Russia in 1918 to large-scale capitalism and to socialism through one and the same intermediary station called National Accounting and Control of Production and Distribution, end quote. Fighting against state capitalism in 1918 was, according to Lenin, quote, beating the air, end quote. The allegation that the Soviet Republic was threatened with, quote, evolution in the direction of state capitalism, end quote, would, quote, provoke nothing but Homeric laughter, end quote. If a merchant told him that there had been an improvement on some railways, Quote, such praise seems to me a thousand times more valuable than 20 communist resolutions, end quote. Lenin. Then reading passages such as the, when reading passages such as the above, it is difficult to understand how some comrades can simultaneously claim to be, quote, Leninist, end quote, and claim that the Russian society is a form of state capitalism to be deplored. Some, however, manage to do just this. It is crystal clear from the above and from other passages written at the time that the, quote, proletarian, end quote, nature of the regime was seen by nearly all the Bolshevik leaders as hinging on the proletarian nature of the party that had taken state power. None of them saw the proletarian nature of the Russian regime as primarily and crucially dependent on the exercise of workers' power at the point of production, i.e. on workers' met, quote, on workers' management of production. It should have been obvious to them as Marxists that if the working class did not hold economic power, its, quote, political, end quote, power would at best be insecure and would, in fact, soon degenerate. The Bolshevik leadership saw the capitalist organization of production as something which in itself was socially neutral. It could be used indifferently for bad purposes, as with as when the bourgeoisie used it with the aim of private accumulation, or good ones, as when the, quote, workers state, end quote, used it, quote, for the benefit of the many, end quote. Lenin put this quite bluntly, quote, socialism, end quote, Lenin said, quote, is nothing but state capitalist monopoly made to benefit the whole people, end quote. What was wrong with capitalist methods of production in Lenin's eyes was that they had in the past served the bourgeoisie. They were now going to be used by the worker state and would thereby become, quote, one of the conditions of socialism, end quote. It all depended on who held state power, end quote. Oh, excuse me, there's no quote there. It all depended on who held state power. The argument that Russia was a worker state because of the nationalization of the means of production was only put forward by Trotsky in 1936. 
He was trying to reconcile his view that, quote, the Soviet Union had to be defended, end quote, with his view that, quote, the Bolshevik Party was no longer a workers' party, end quote. May 24th to June 4th. First All-Russian Congress of Regional Economic Councils held in Moscow. May 24th to June 4th. First All-Russian Congress of Regional Economic Councils held in Moscow. This, quote, economic parliament, end quote, was attended by rather more than 100 voting delegates and 150 non-voting delegates drawn from Vysenka, its Glavki, and centers from regional and local Savnarkozy, and from the trade unions. The Congress was presided over by Rykov, a man of, quote, unimpeachable record and colorless opinions, end quote. Cited in Carr. Uh, where am I? Okay. Lenin opened the proceedings with a plea for, quote, labor discipline, end quote, and a long explanation of the need to employ the highly paid spetsy specialists. Osinski stood uncompromisingly for the democratization of industry. Osinski led an attack on, quote, peace rates, end quote, end quote, Taylorism, end quote. He was supported by Smirnov and a number of provincial delegates. The, quote, opposition, end quote, urged the recognition and the completion of the de facto nationalization of industry, which the factory committees were bringing about, and called for the establishment of an overall national economic authority based on and representing the organs of workers' control. They called for, quote, a workers' administration, not only from above, but from below, end quote, as the indispensable economic base for the new regime. Lamov, in a plea for a massive extension of workers' control, warned that, quote, bureaucratic centralization was strangling the forces of the country. The masses are being cut off from living creative power in all branches of the, our economy, end quote. He reminded the Congress that Lenin's phrase about, quote, learning from the capitalists, end quote, had been coined in the 1890s by the quasi-Marxist and present bourgeois, Struva. I think the first name might be Peter Struva, but I'm not sure. Or maybe it's Paul Struva. It's P. Struva, I think, something? I don't know. Who gives a shit what I know? There then took place one of those episodes which can highlight a whole discussion and epitomize the various viewpoints. A subcommittee of the Congress passed a resolution that two-thirds of the representatives of the management boards of industrial enterprises should be elected among the workers. Lenin was furious at this, quote, stupid decision, end quote. Under his guidance, a plenary session of the Congress, quote, corrected, end quote, the resolution and decreed that no more than one-third of the managerial personnel of industrial enterprises should be elected. The management committees were to be integrated into the previously outlined complex hierarchical structure which vested veto rights in the Supreme Economic Council, the Senka, set up in December 1917. The Congress formally endorsed a resolution from the Trade Union Central Council asserting the principle of, quote, a definite fixed rate of productivity in return for a, a guaranteed wage, end quote. It accepted the institution of piecework and of bonuses. A, quote, climate of opinion rather than a settled policy was in the course of formation, end quote. May 25th, 1918. Clashes between government forces and troops of the Czech Legion and the Urals. Anti-Bolshevik uprisings throughout Siberia and southeastern Russia. Beginning of large-scale civil war and beginning of allied intervention. Those who wish to incriminate the civil war for anti-proletarian Bolshevik practices can do so from now on. June 28th. Council of People's Commissars. <clears throat> 
after an all-night sitting, issues decree on the general nationalization involving all industrial enterprises with a capital of over 1 million rubles. The aim of the decree were the aims of the decree were quote a decisive struggle against disorganization in production and supply end quote. The sectors affected whose assets were now declared the property of the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic were the mining, metallurgical, textile, electrical, timber, tobacco, resin, glass, and pottery, leather, and cement industries, all steam-driven mills, local utilities, and private railways, together with a few other minor industries. The task of, quote, organizing the administration of nationalized enterprises, end quote, was entrusted, as, quote, as a matter of urgency, end quote, to Visenka and its sections. But until Vasenka issued specific instructions regarding individual enterprises covering, covered by the decree, quote, such enterprises would be regarded as least rent-free to their former owners who would continue to finance them and to draw revenue from them, end quote. The legal transfer of individual enterprises to the state was easily transacted. The assumption of managerial function by appointees was to take a little longer, but this process was also to be completed within a few months. Both steps had been accelerated under the threat of foreign intervention. The change in the property relations had been deep going. In this sense, a profound revolution had taken place, quote, as the revolution had unleashed civil war, so civil war was to intensify the revolution, end quote, R.V. Daniels. But as far as any fundamental changes in the relations of production were concerned, the revolution was already spent. The period of, quote, war communism, end quote, now starting was to see the working class lose what little power it had enjoyed in production, during the last few weeks of 1917 and the first few weeks of 1918, July 4th to 10th, Fifth All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Throughout the first half of 1918, the issue of, quote, nationalization, end quote, had been the subject of bitter controversy between the, quote, left, end quote, communist and the Leninists. Lenin had been opposed to the total nationalization of the means of production immediately after October. This was not because of any wish to do a political deal with the bourgeoisie, but because of his underestimation of the technological and administrative maturity of the proletariat, a maturity that would have been put, in, put to an immediate test had all major industry been formally nationalized. The result had been an extremely complex situation in which some industries had been nationalized, quote, from above, end quote, i.e. by the decree of the central government, and others, quote, from below, end quote, i.e. where workers had taken over enterprises abandoned by their former owners. While in yet other places, the former owners were still in charge of their factories, although restricted in their freedom of action or authority by the encroachment of the factory committees. Kritzman, one of the ablest theoreticians of, quote, left, end quote, communism, had criticized this state of affairs from an early date. He had referred to the, quote, workers, end quote, excuse me, he had referred to the, quote, workers' control, end quote, decree of November 14th, 1917 as, quote, half measures, therefore unrealizable, end quote. Quote, as a slogan of workers' control implied the growing but as yet insufficient power of the proletariat, it was the implied expression of a weakness still to be overcome of the working class movement. Employers would not be inclined to run their businesses with the sole aim of teaching the workers how to manage them. Conversely, the workers felt only hatred for the capitalists and saw no reason why they should voluntarily remain exploited, end quote. Osinski, another, quote, left, end quote, communist, stressed another aspect, quote, the fate of the workers' control slogan, end quote, he wrote, quote, is most interesting. Born of the wish to unmask the opponent, it failed when it sought to convert itself into a system, where, despite everything, it fulfilled itself, its content altered completely from what we had originally envisaged. It took the form of a decentralized dictatorship of the subordination of capitalists taken individually to various working class organizations acting independently of one another.
Workers' control had originally been aimed at subordinating the owners of the means of production, but this coexistence soon became intolerable. The state of dual power between managers and workers soon held to the collapse of the enterprise, soon led to the collapse of the enterprise, or it rapidly became transformed into the total power of the workers without the least author authorization of the central powers, end quote. Much, quote, left, end quote, communist writing at this time stressed the theme that early nationalization of the means of production would have avoided any, many of these ambiguities. Total expropriation of the capitalists would have allowed one to proceed immediately from, quote, control to, quote, workers' management, end quote, through the medium of some central organism regulating the whole of the socialized economy. It is interesting that Lazovsky, although at the time strongly opposed to the viewpoint of the, quote, left, end quote, communists, because he felt that the revolution had only been a, quote, bourgeois democratic, end quote, revolution, was later to write, quote, it was soon to be proved that in the era of social revolution, a constitutional monarchy in each enterprise, i.e. the previous boss, but only exercising limited power, was impossible, and the former owner, however complex the structure of a modern enterprise, was a superfluous cog, end quote. Lazovsky, The Trade Unions in Soviet Russia. A split occurred a little later among the, quote, left, end quote, communists. Radek reached an agreement with the Leninists. He was prepared to accept, quote, one-man management, end quote, in principle, not too hard a task for a non-proletarian, because it was now to be applied in the context of the extensive nationalization decrees of June 1918. In Raddick's opinion, these decrees would help ensure the, quote, proletarian basis of the regime, end quote. Bukharin, too, broke with Osinski and re rejoined the fold. Osinski and his supporters however, proceeded to form a new oppositional tendency, the, quote, democratic centralist, end quote, so called because of their opposition to the, quote, bureaucratic centralism, end quote, of the party leadership. They continued to agitate for workers' management of production. Their ideas and those of the original group of, quote, left, end quote, communists were to play an important role in the development two years later of the workers' opposition. With the Civil War and, quote, war communism, end quote, the issues appeared for a while to become blurred. There was little production for anyone to control. Quote, the issues of 1918, however, were only postponed. They could not be forgotten thanks to the left communists, end quote, work of criticism. Oh, excuse me. That's an apostrophe, not a quotation mark. Quote, the issues of 1918, however, were only postponed. They could not be forgotten thanks to the left communists' work of criticism. As soon as the military respite permitted, left-wing oppositionists were ready to raise again the fundamental question of the social nature of the Soviet regime, end quote. R.V. Daniels. August 1918. High Point of Volga Offensive by the Whites The Civil War immensely accelerated the process of economic centralization, as a knowledge of previous Bolshevik practice might have led one to expect. This was to prove an extremely bureaucratic form of centralization. The whole Russian economy was, quote, reorganized, end quote, on a semi-military basis. The Civil War tended to transform all major industry into a supply organization for the Red Army. This made industrial policy a matter of military strategy. It is worth pointing out at this stage that we doubt if there is any intrinsic merit in decentralization as some anarchists maintain. The Paris Commune, a Congress of Soviets, or a Shop Stewards Committee or Strike Committee to take modern analogies are all highly centralized yet fairly democratic feudalism on the on the other hand was both decentralized and highly bureaucratic the key question is whether the quote de the key question is whether the quote centralized end quote apparatus is controlled from below by elected and revocable delegates or whether it separates itself from those on whose behalf it is allegedly acting
The period witnessed a considerable fall in production due to a complex variety of factors that have been well described elsewhere. The trouble was often blamed by party spokesmen on the influence of heretical, quote, anarcho-syndicalist, end quote, ideas. Mistakes had certainly been made, but what had been the growing pains of a new movement were now being attributed to the inherent vices of any attempt by the workers to dominate production. Quote, workers' control over industry carried out by the factory and plant committees, end quote, wrote one government spokesman, quote, has shown what can be expected if the plans of the anarchists are realized, end quote. Attempts at control from below were now being systematically suppressed. Proletarian partisans of the individual factory committees tried to resist, but their resistance was easily overcome. Bitterness and despair developed among sections of the proletariat and by no means, quote, backward, end quote, sections. Each factor must also be taken into account, but seldom are. In discussing the fall of production and the widespread resort to, quote, anti-social activities, end quote, so characteristic of the years of, quote, war communism, end quote. August 25th to September 1st, 1918. First All-Russian Conference of Anarcho-Syndicalists meets in Moscow. The Industrial Resolution accused the government of, quote, betraying the working class with its suppression of workers' control in favor of such capitalist devices as one-man management, labor discipline, and the employment of, quote, bourgeois, end quote, engineers and technicians. By forsaking the factory committees, the beloved child of the great workers' revolution, for those, quote, dead organizations, end quote, the trade unions, and by substituting decrees and red tape for industrial democracy, the Bolshevik leadership was creating a monster of, quote, state capitalism, end quote, a bureaucratic behemoth which it ludicrously called socialism, end quote. Volny Golos Truda. The Free Voice of Labor was established as the successor to Golos Truda. Closed down in May 1918, the new paper was itself closed down after its fourth issue, September 16, 1918. This had contained an interesting article by, quote, M. Sergvin, end quote. Maximov, maybe? It might have been, it, there's a question mark. Uh, called, quote, Paths of Revolution, end quote. The article, quote, made a remarkable departure from the usual condemnation of the Bolsheviks as, quote, betrayers of the working class, end quote. Lenin and his followers were not necessarily cold-blooded cynics who, with Machiavellian cunning, had mapped out the new class structure in advance to satisfy their personal lust for power. Quite possibly, they were motivated by a genuine concern for human suffering, but the division of society into administrators and workers followed inexorably from the centralization of authority. It could not be otherwise. Once the functions of management and labor had become separated, the former assigned to a minority of, quote, export, experts, end quote, and the latter to the untutored masses, all possibility of dignity or, or equality were destroyed, end quote. That was cited in Average. Paul Average. I think it's the Russian Anarchist would be the book called, or maybe it was the Anarchist in the Russian Revolution. I'm not sure, but Paul Average wrote a bunch of books about Russian anarchism. Anyway, end of quote. In the same issue, Maximov slammed the quote Manilovs, end quote in the Anarchist camp as quote, romantic visionaries who pined for pastoral utopias, oblivious of the complex forces at work in the modern world, it was time to stop dreaming of the golden age. It was time to organize and act, end quote. For these principled yet realistic views, Maximov and the anarcho-syndicalists were to be viciously attacked as, quote, anarcho-bureaucratic judices by other tendencies in the anarchist movement, end quote. Average. Uh, footnote. It says, Manilov was a daydreaming landowner in Gogol's Dead Souls. End of footnote. August 1918. 
A government decree fixes the composition of the Vysenska to 30 members nominated by the All-Russian Central Council of Trade Unions, 20 nominated by the Regional Councils of National Economy, Sovnarkozy, and 10 nominated by the All-Russian Central Executive of the Soviets, VTSIK. Current Vysenka business was to be entrusted to a presidium of nine other members of whom the president and his deputy were nominated by the Council of the People's Commissars, Sovnarkom, and the others by the VTSIK. The presidium was officially supposed to implement the policies decided at the monthly meetings of all 69 of the Vysenka members. But it soon came to undertake more and more of the work. After the autumn of 1918, full meetings of the Vysenka were no longer held. It had become a department of state. In other words, within a year of the capture of state power by the Bolsheviks, the relations of production, shaken for a while at the height of the mass movement, had reverted to the classical authoritarian pattern seen in all class societies. The workers, as workers have been divested of any meaningful decisional authority in the matters that concern them most. September 28th, the Bolshevik trade union leader Tomsky declares at the first All-Russian Congress of Communist Railwaymen that, quote, it was the task of the communists, firstly, to create well-knit trade unions in their own industries, secondly, to take possession of these organizations by tenacious work, Thirdly, to stand at the head of these organizations. Fourthly, to expel all non-proletarian organizations. And fifthly, to take the union under our own communist influence, end quote. October 1918. Government decree reiterates the ruling that no body other than Vysenka Quote, in its capacity as the central organ regulating and organizing the whole production of the republic, end quote, has the right to sequester industrial enterprises. The need to publish such a decree suggests that local Soviets, or perhaps even Sovnarkozy, local Sovnarkozy, were doing just that. November 6th to 9th, 6th All-Russian Congress of Soviets. November 25th to December 1st. Second All-Russian Conference of Anarcho-Syndicalists meets in Moscow. December, a new decree abolished the regional Sovnarkozy and recognized the provincial Sovnarkozy as, quote, executive organs of Vysenka, end quote. The local Sovnarkozy were to become, quote, economic sections, end quote, of the executive committees of the corresponding local Soviets. The Glavki, were to have their own subordinate organs at provincial headquarters. Quote, this clearly represented a further step towards the centralized control of every branch of industry all over the country by its Glavk, or center, in Moscow, under the supreme authority of Vysenka. End quote. E.H. Carr. December 1918, Second All-Russian Congress of Regional Economic Councils. Molotov analyzed the membership of 20 most important Glavki, end quote, centers, end quote. Of 400 persons concerned, over 10% were former employers or employers' representatives, 9% technicians, 38% officials from various departments, including the Senka, and the remaining 43% workers of representatives of workers' organizations, including trade unions. The management of production was predominantly in the hands of persons, quote, having no relation to the proletarian elements in industry, end quote. The Glavki had to be regarded as, quote, organs in no way corresponding to the proletarian dictatorship, end quote. Those who directed policy were, quote, employers' representatives, technicians, and specialists, end quote. It was, quote, Quote, it was indisputable that the Soviet bureaucrat of these early years was, as a rule, a former member of the bourgeois intelligentsia or official class and brought with him many of the traditions of the old Russian bureaucracy. End quote. E. H. Carr.